Nisa. I'm delighted today to be joined by Sam Doctor, Chief Strategist at BitUda. Sam, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. It's great. It's great to have you. So we're here today uh, to discuss the recent report that uh, BitUda published in partnership with Fidelity Center for Applied Economics that provides an extremely in-depth analysis of the state of Bitcoin mining. And so for our viewers who may not know BitUda, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, you and your company and the relationship that you have with Fidelity? Sure. So by training, I'm a semiconductor engineer spent most of my career at JP Morgan then and, and then at Fundstrat, where I helped build out the crypto research um, while I was there. I joined Batuda in November of last year to really head up the strategy research and advisory uh, business here. Okay. Batuda is an institution focused, um, you know, high touch agency brokerage that's fully regulated. So we're probably the only entity that's regulated both by the SEC and by the CFTC. Um, okay, so Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin mining has become a global industrial scale operation, which um, functions across an entire network, um, if not the entire public blockchain industry, um, depends on Bitcoin mining. So um, let's talk a little bit about how you collated the report. Uh, who was um, included in your survey and what was the geographical coverage? Sure. So as you can imagine, you know, Bitcoin is an extremely secretive industry. And so um, while we've spoken with a lot of miners, a lot of it was on condition of anonymity. So, you know, especially because they're sharing essentially their secret sauce, which right. is their power price. Um, but having said that, you know, we spoke with about 67 different miners and several uh, mining rig up uh, manufacturers as well as uh, resellers and distributors. And we covered information on about 153 different locations across 21 countries. So Bitcoin mining is, as, as you've just noted, very competitive um, and has moved you know, from bedroom to industrial scale operations over the past few years. And yeah. um, as I understand it, the most critical factors that um, miners need to take into account are the cost of electricity, the price and supply of the mining hardware, and the political stability in the region that they're located. So can you tell us what your findings were across some of those areas? For example, what's the current median cost today to mine Bitcoin? And, and is there one? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, what we did was identified power price for about 40% of the total network. Okay. And so based on that, you know, sort of extrapolating from there, we uh, estimated what the median price would be for the whole network. Uh, the power price appears to be about a three cent median. The range is from under a cent in some geographies and goes all the way up to about uh, eight to nine cents. Mm -hmm. The median is about three cents. So at that price, the median price to mine a Bitcoin works out to roughly about $5,000. Okay. All right. Um, and how about the geographies? Um, does does that play a key role? I'm assuming that you know power is much more cost effective in some countries than in others. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that China seems to be one of the lowest cost uh, jurisdictions. We um, certainly spoke with several Chinese miners, but we have less information for about China than we do for some of the other countries. Um, you know, for the U.S., we think that we probably spoke with miners accounting for about 80% of total US mining capacity. You know, so we basically spoke with almost everyone. Okay. And that is also true for somebody, you know, places like Iceland. But mm -hmm. in China, we, we spoke with, I think, uh, you know, roughly about 15% of, of China's uh, mining capacity. But in terms of the number of miners, far less than 15%. We spoke with some of the larger ones. The hash rate recently reached an all time high after a sharp drop um, after the halving event. And yeah. so uh, even though the, the Bitcoin price remained pretty stable for a long time until just recently this week. Right. So why did this happen given the miners revenue was effectively cut in half overnight in May? I think that's a great question. And I think there are probably several different factors that play in. Um, the first is the, um, the lower price power that you see in China, particularly with the, uh, the hydro season 
and I think that there might have been some migration of capacity from slightly higher power prices to lower power prices. Mm -hmm. What that meant is that older generation rigs like S9, which were temporarily non-profitable, returned to profitability with both the fall in hash rate initially and the lower power price. Okay. As hash rate starts climbing again, I think some of those older rigs might again become less profitable. That's a function of whether price can keep up as well. The other factors that I would say is there are a number of mining rigs that have been paid for months ago. And as you probably know, mining rigs can sometimes take three to six months of you know, delivery time from the time you pay for them. So once you receive them, and especially if they're newer generation rigs that are more profitable than old generation rigs, you're going to turn them on. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, you, you, when you turn them on, the, the other thing to remember is you could turn off two old S9 rigs, which would generate about 28 terahashes, and replace it with an S19 rig, which generates 110 terahashes. So even yeah. without power consumption increasing, the hash rate could effectively triple or, or almost quadruple with nothing else changing, just simply getting a new rig. Yeah. So many detractors over the years, um, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, have argued that Bitcoin mining consumes such a large amount of energy that it can be only bad for the environment and a huge waste of energy. Um, I spoke with uh, Appling Blandon at the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance yesterday, actually, about this topic. Mm -hmm. Um, and they have a Bitcoin mining index. So it's, it's a little bit different than your study, um, but it kind of gives a real-time calculation of how much energy is being consumed by mm -hmm. the Bitcoin network. And um, she gave me a stat that essentially the amount of energy that's being used today could power the University of Cambridge for like 312 years or something. <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> it's like, well, that sounds like a lot. Um, yep. So how much energy does the network currently consume? Um, and how much damage is it actually doing to the environment? So we estimate it consumes roughly about seven gigawatts of energy. Um, at this point in time, we think it peaked out. So at, that for something for us. So yeah. What, what, so so um, I think one of the things that people really think about, are, you know, you think about countries, I would rather think of it from an industry perspective. And, you know, I, in our point of view, you know, Bitcoin mining is essentially a form of computing power. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, closest analog we might think of is the data center industry, okay. which consumes close to 30 gigawatts of power a year. So okay. that's about four times what, okay. the, uh, what the Bitcoin mining industry consumes. Um, in terms of the mix of power, um, what's interesting is an industry like data centers needs to have incredibly high speed capacity. It has to have low latency. And so very often they're uh, located right near where the demand is, which could be, for example, just outside of a major city mm -hmm. uh, to take advantage of, of high-speed connections and low latency. Um, so that power tends to be more expensive and that power also tends to be just what, you know, that, that tends to be essential power, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Bitcoin, you can mine with a much lower bandwidth. You are very often in much more remote areas. And so you're using power that would otherwise go to waste. A lot of mm -hmm. it, a lot of the Bitcoin mining power is, is hydroelectric power. Yeah. And so, you know, especially when you think about China's flood season, you know, the reason why they sell power to Bitcoin miners for as low as a penny um, per kilowatt hour is because the alternative to that is letting it, uh, letting that water spill over the spillway and not generate any power at all. Yeah. So it doesn't, you know, that's consume... a big period of time, isn't it? It's something like from that, March to October. That is a brief period of time, absolutely. Um, when we think about the distribution that is, um, you know, across the different uh, geographies that we've looked at, you know, it the we, we think that a substantial portion of, of overall mining capacity is uh, renewable. So whether it's hydroelectric or geothermal in Iceland, for example, um, or whether it is you know, wind or solar driven. Some of it is also um, what we might call demand response driven. I think that's an, something that's not as big a piece yet, but it's really coming up. And so when you think about you know, areas where the, there is a 
ability of the um, of the miner to shut down their capacity very quickly during periods of peak demand that might be an opportunity to reduce the the power price and so i think that there are a number of different factors that mean that i think that the power demand is not necessarily um you know i would say it's it's a valuable power demand whether it's because it's incremental power that would go waste power that's being generated in markets that that don't have demand anymore for example where you know that have regions that have deindustrialized to some extent and so your power capacity that is stranded and mm-hmm. um and and finally i think demand response or load response solutions are an important addition to the stability of the grid okay so given the way that mining economics works um any significant price uh, increase in bitcoin uh, means that its energy demand will rise in tandem so you know what does that mean for existing miners um what scale of funding will be required to support that type of growth yeah so um that's a really an interesting dynamic because as the price of um bitcoin increases miners make more money which means that they have more capital to invest in growing capacity as mm-hmm. well as makes it makes it easier for them to raise more money because it's an uh, it's an attractive investment for outside funding and so as that increases and in, with some lag the capacity comes online hash rate increases and um your earnings in bitcoin fall per unit per peta hash of your own capacity and so it's sort of it's a, it's a little bit of a circular reference um and as a result you know we we sort of think about this as how far can hash rate go, uh, go and what would it take to get there you know we mm-hmm. think that hash rate which is now about 135 exa hashes could get to you know about 260 in about a year and 360 in two years and to get there you know it it requires over 6 billion dollars of of capital investment and to uh, you know that i think most of that probably roughly about 4 billion of that would need to be external funding now that of course is a function of price if bitcoin went to 20000 dollars you don't need as much as external funding because you're making more money yourself right Fascinating stuff, Sam. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I could spend another 20 minutes uh, <laughs> digging into this with you. I will absolutely read the report. Um, we'll have you back on again. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay.